in uh, Genesis, and we, we talked about uh, Abraham last week and about how he tried to manipulate what God was giving him. Uh, we've seen how he had came and uh, how he told Sarah that it uh, to act as his uh, sister and because he was afraid of his life. And then we go into uh, different chapters. We see uh, in chapter 17 where God changes Abram's name to Abraham and uh, he made the covenant with him at that time. In chapter 20, we find where Abraham, uh, again, they made the covenant, continue on in that. In 21, Isaac was born. In chapter 22 through 25, you see the sacrifice of Isaac. Sarah passes. Abraham passes. The story of Isaac and Rebekah. And so we come to a place where uh, in Numbers chapter 13 and 1, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on to De Deuteronomy. But it says this in Numbers 13, chapter uh, 13, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. And in the midst of the second verse, if you look in your references, of your Bible, most will reference you to what we're about to read here today, Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting with verse 19. Then we set out from Herob and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which... The Lord our God has given us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your father, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. The thing seemed good to me, and I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe, and they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkol and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, It is good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Us. So you see in Numbers 13 where it says the Lord had sinned and then you see this preference here where it takes us to do Deuteronomy chapter 1 where Moses begins to explain uh, that indeed God told him to go up and possess it but the men came to him and asked him to spy out the land or scout out the land and Moses thought it was a good idea. And so he got one person from each tribe and uh, we know how the story uh, uh, unfolds, but uh, a lot of times when we look at this, we must understand that God had gave them the initial uh, uh, guidance of going and possessing the land. But what you see here is some people, the children of Israel, who come up and say, "Listen, let's scout this thing out. Let's let's look over this promised land." And it seemed good to Moses, and so Moses agreed with what they were saying. I believe what we see in a lot of times is that when God tells us and God directs us to do things in our lives, it seems as though we put parameters on God. Amen? We put parameters on God. We say, well, Lord, let me, let me see if this works or if that works. Let's, let's, let's look over it and see if it's good. But I'm here to tell you today, when God tells us to go and to possess something, He has... Uh, the, the power to overcome any obstacle and we shouldn't fear when God tells us to go and to do. You heard Linda today, uh, this morning speak about how it just rocked her world because she understood uh, the difference when she went to the land and seen the herd and the destruction that was there. Can you imagine if we uh, sometimes in our lives would just obey what God asks us to do? We don't always have to know how it's going to turn out. We don't always have to know everything that it pertains to. 
One thing that I've learned in ministry is that when God tells you to do something, simply obey His Word. God is the one who is responsible for the results. When we ask God to help us in our ministries or help us in our lives, we've got to be willing to obey what He tells us to do. See, you see Moses where God instructs him to go. To possess the land. There should be nothing hindering you from possessing the land, but he got to listening to other folks. And that's how it turns out a lot of times. God has given us hope. He's given us direction. He has given us promise. He has given us purpose. And God is coming in and he's telling us and he's filling our heart full of faith and, and full of hope and promise. And then all of a sudden we start listening to everyone else. It can't be done that way. I don't know if that's the right way. Isn't that kind of what they ran to? You go back to Numbers 13, there's a report. I'm going to read the report very quickly. In Numbers 13, verse 25, it says, And at the end of the 40 days they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to a land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and it is fruit. And then this is its fruit, and they showed them the fruit of the land. Then you notice in verse 28, it says, However, we all have a lot of howevers in our lives, don't we? It's easy for us to put a however in our vocabulary we see the good things but however we begin to think about the bad things what if what if this happens what if that happens you see they gave the good report they said it's flowing with milk and honey and here is his fruit as an example and as they began to see the fruit they say to the congregation and the people however there's a contradiction that is coming. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. They're very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And the Michaelites dwell in the land of Negeb. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Then... A man enters the picture named Caleb. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go at once and occupy. Isn't that what God told him to do in the first place? To go and to occupy, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the men who had gone up with him had said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought the people to the people of Israel a bad report of the land, and they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. There's a couple of observations I want to talk with you in just a few moments here. God goes and tells them, possess the land. But the Israelites wanted to wait. He tells us, and it shows us through this story, that not everyone will go with you to your promised land. I want you to understand some things. Is that when God gives you a promise, that promise is given to you. When God gives you a purpose, that purpose is given to you. And what we realize in ministry is that a lot of people who start with you usually don't finish with you. And that's one of the hardest things to take in ministry. We must understand that the purpose that God has given us, that there's going to be people who don't see it like we see it or feel it like we feel it, but it does not make it true. It doesn't make it a promise uh, uh, or, or it doesn't make it as though it doesn't exist because other people don't see it. 
You see example after example in the Bible of people who are given a promise that God promised to be with them and to help them. That other peoples didn't see that promise, but yet God intervened and God helped them be victorious in their life. So in those observations today, we must understand that God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. Not everyone is going to get on board, but that's okay. Not everybody is going to see what you see or feel how you feel, but that's all right too. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Sometimes we get bogged down just like Moses did, just like the ten spies who tried to say and overtake what Caleb and Joshua was telling them with the, uh, uh, with the fire that they had that they knew that with God with them they could take this promised land. They knew with every fiber of their being. But the other ten were saying how difficult it was. God never told us that obtaining the promises that he has for us was going to be easy. He never told us that there wouldn't be work to do. But he told us that he would be with us all the way. Not everyone will see it or feel it. But God will give you the determination and the power to overcome and to continue on. There are a lot of people too that see the promise, that see the vision but are not willing to fight. Amen. There's a lot of people who sees where you're going and sees the promise that God has in your life and that what God has purposed you to do in your life. They cheer you on from the bleachers, but they're not willing to fight with you. But we have to carry on. I tell you, a lot of times where we get stuck is our expectation of people. We can't have an expectation of people. We have to have an expectation of the power of the Holy Spirit working with inside of us so that we don't put all of our hope in others or in man, but we put our hope and our rest in Him, knowing that He is the one who will supply our needs and help us in our times of need. Some will see the promise, but are not willing to fight for it. There are four essential tra traits, real quickly, that I want you to consider that we must have to obtain the promises of God and enter into our promised land. We've got to have commitment. Commitment today is totally different than what commitment was when I was growing up. When you were committed to something, you were committed to it and you gave all that you had to it. You were obligated, not only uh, through your, your uh, words, but your heart and your soul was committed to the cause of Christ. We see here, Caleb said, let us go up at once for we are well able to overcome it. He was committed to do the work to fight. He was willing when everyone else was saying no, the other ten was saying no, it's impossible. He was willing to be committed and say, I will do all that's within me even if it costs me my life. We will go. Let's go at once. He was committed to the cause of Christ. I tell you, the thing that we look at in commitment is commitment and in the definition, even though we think commitment differently today, the commitment, the word commitment has not changed. The standard of commitment that God requires from the Christian has not changed. But it's our outlook. It's the pressures of life. It's to take the easy road. It's to look at the promise and all the goodness that God has done for us. But we say to ourselves, it's too difficult to possess. It's too hard. It's too complicated. There's too many things that are going on. I'm not really willing to do what I need to do to get where I need to be. That's the world we're living in today. They lack commitment because they're more afraid of what their brothers and sisters will say than what God feels or thinks or says. But in order to obtain, we have to be committed to the cause of Christ. We have to be committed 
to what he has placed in our hearts to do. We have to be committed to him. When everything else falls apart, he is the only one who will stand with us. When everything else seems to go astray and everything seems to go crazy, God is the one who still gives us the foundation that we can stand on. Commitment to him is a requirement to see his goodness and his mercy flow even in the most difficult times of our lives. Second thing you know is a trait that you look for those who obtain the promise and those who walk in the promises of God is that they keep their eyes on Him. That's one of the easiest things to do in our lives is to take our eyes off God. Oftentimes, instead of looking up to heaven and looking up spiritually to God and keeping our eyes focused on Him, it's easy for us to look down in temporal fashion, look at all the things that are going wrong, all of the difficult situations, all the things that can so easily beset us, hinder us, make us feel that there's no purpose or make us feel it's really hard that it, it, it might not even be worth it even to a point of giving up. But we have to keep those who obtain the promises or those who keeps their eyes on God regardless of the turmoil that's around them. Today, I don't know what you're dealing with. And I, I know everyone in this building, God has given us promises. He gives us promises in His Word. And He tells us that if we would apply the promises and apply our faith to those things and we commit to Him and we focus on His promises and His ways, that He will guarantee us that He will help us. It might not be like we thought it would be, but He will help us to give us the strength to overcome the situations in our life. Because we understand in our lives today, when we are committed to Him, when we keep our eyes on Him, it's not Him that changes, but it's us. We change because we begin to understand and build our faith in knowing that God is with us. It doesn't matter if everyone else thinks it's impossible. We understand what the Word says clearly, that with God, all things are possible. We have to keep it. We have to keep our eyes on the promises of God. Another trait that most people who live in victory and live in the promised land and to obtain the promises of God, they have thick skin. That's a rarity in today's world. Thick skin. They're not moved by the feelings of man or the opinions of man. They've faced their giants head on. They've been through times in their lives where no one believed in them and everyone counted them out and everyone threw them to the side and thought they were worthless and wasn't worth their time. But they continued on. They wasn't paralyzed by the voice of the world. But instead... They were motivated by being in the presence of God. They were motivated by getting in His Spirit and praying and seeking after Him through their commitments and their focus on Him. That they developed a, a desire to be more pleasing unto God than be pleasing unto man. You live in a society where they're just looking for offense in this world. They're just waiting on someone to offend them. They're waiting on them to offend them so that they can give them the what for. Amen. They want everybody to know how they feel and how they think. They think that their value of what they have to say is more important than what God has to say. And I'm here to tell you the most important thing and the voice we need to listen to is from God. 
the most important thing is that when everyone else says it's impossible and everyone else is telling you uh, how they think about it is not to listen is to drown it out by getting in the presence of God and allowing him to melt away all of those negative things in our lives so we can reach out to him and, and, and allow him to use us the way he wants to use us thick skin is something that is not just usually given to one but it's something that is developed through time amen you see a little baby, when you tell a baby no, what's the first thing they do? They cry, right? We still got a lot of grown up babies in the world. You think these things, you understand as time goes on, as the battles and the conflicts we face in our life, we understand that just because words are thrown out and situations come at us, that there's still breath in our body. There's still another sun that rises. There's still another day that passes. And it gives us the opportunity to grow and to develop our relationship and our mature our relationship with God. So that when the enemy comes in and tries to deter us and get us down and out, we can live a life of victory knowing that God is with us. I never said it wouldn't be difficult. I never said that sometimes the devil will land punches. But we have the opportunity to give it to God, to allow God to use those things uh, that turned, uh, that was meant for our harm, to turn it into our good if we walk by faith and we trust in Him. That we develop a thick skin to keep our tongue where it's supposed to be, in our mouths. And allow God to do the work. See, we want to help God out too many times. That's what's wrong with the Israelite children here. They wanted to help God out too many times. They thought they knew better than God. They thought they knew that, that, that they needed to help him out just a little bit. You could see them crying like little two-year-olds. You can see them murmuring and complaining. Even here, when the ten spies says it's not worth it, they begin to cry and say, Why don't we go back to Egypt? I'm here to tell you today that Egypt's always crying. Egypt is always crying out. It's always the temptation of the believer. Egypt is always crying. Egypt is always crying out saying, come back. Come back to bondage. Come back to where it's easy. Come back to where everything is settled and that you're in a, uh, uh, you're in a, a familiar place so that you can be comfortable and you can be of no to no effect. Thick skin says, you know what, I'm not going to listen to the enemy. But I'm going to be committed to Christ. I'm going to focus on his promises. And I'm going to walk in his ways. And the fourth thing, and I close with this as the musicians come. Setting our eyes on the mark. I don't know about you today. God has been waking me up these last few months early in the morning. And I'm telling you, I'm not an early riser. But God has been waking me up. It's as though there's an alarm that's going off in my heart, in my soul, of the lost, not only in our community, but the lost in this world, the lost in our homes, in our family. He's been waking me up because he's been trying to download some things in my heart that I know that he is calling me to do. And I'm so thankful that I can hear his voice, first of all. And I'm so thankful that he's downloading these things into my heart. But with that download comes a burden that begins to shift the way you function. It begins to shift you because you understand that the battle is great, but our God is greater. I understand these ten men looking at all of the things that were hard. I understand them looking and saying, man, these are, these are tall gates. These are tall fences. 
These are giant men. We're so small. I can understand them saying, you know, Lord, I don't know that we truly have the fight. I can understand those things. No one wants to be a Caleb. No one wants to be a Joshua. That's in numbers. Everybody wants to be the Caleb and Joshua. That's in Joshua. Where they see the end. But the fact about the end is that as soon as they obtained the promised land, they went right back to what they were doing. And I believe that it's a commission from God to His people. To His people not back then, but His people today. If you are a child of God, this is for you. We've allowed the ten scouts for too long to talk for us. We've allowed others' opinions of what can work and what can't work keep us in Egypt. But I believe with all my heart that God is starting to do a work in not only side of me, but stirring up at the gifts inside of each and every one of you. It's going to come a time where just the same old, same old ain't getting it anymore. The same way that you do things, the same way that you approach things, it's not going to mean the same anymore because God's going to begin, I believe, and I've been praying that God begin to stir us, to stir our hearts because He's coming soon and very, very soon. We have to be okay with being the only one who's willing to obtain the promises of God. We've got to be okay if we're the only church that does it differently. We've got to be okay when God is asking us to change our way of thinking and our preferences that moves us closer to Him, that brings us and shakes us to our core, that brings us closer to His throne. I told you earlier that Egypt will always be crying. To attempt to draw us from our promise. To tempt us from those who camp between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, which is the heaps of ruin. If there's no altar, you will be persuaded by its cries. You will be tempted to go to where it's easy. Egypt will always make the complacent feel safe and secure and make it feel as it's the right place to be. Today, the essential traits, commitment, focus on God's promises, having thick skin and keeping our eyes on the mark. That's going to move the needle of our faith. That's going to bring us to the promised land. And as Linda said, that's going to bring us to the joy of the Lord.